Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And thank you for joining us at Retail Revival this year. My name is Payal Hindocha, and at Imasis and SAP, I have the absolute privilege of working with our clients and our partners to bring our solutions to market. At Imasis, we have the pleasure of working with some of the fastest growing online retail and multi-channel retail businesses, particularly Booktopia in Australia, who have won multiple industry accolades, the National Book Retailer, award of the year for three consecutive years and being the only retailer who have been listed in the BRW Fast 100 as one of the fastest growing brands in the region for eight consecutive years. It's from brands like Booktopia where we can learn how they used customer loyalty to grow and scale their business. Joining us today from the Booktopia team is Stefan Daleng and Edwin Gan from Booktopia. Thank you both for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks guys, happy to be. It's a pleasure to speak with you both today. Stefan, would you mind giving our viewers an introduction of yourself, your role at Booktopia? Yeah, sure. Um, so my name is Stefan Dowling. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer here at Booktopia. Uh, I've been with the business for around two and a half years, and my role here at Booktopia is overseeing uh, all uh, retention, acquisition, brand, uh, PR uh, strategy, and execution here in, in the business. And we got to split up across multiple teams where we're handling all of that in-house. So you, you could more or less say that we operate an in-house agency uh, within a pure play retail. And for those of you who don't know Booktopia already, uh, we're pure play retailer selling books online here in Australia, uh, the largest online bookseller here. Um, and, uh, and like I mentioned before, we, we do everything in-house. So we don't work with that many agencies and we really focus on creating teams of experts within the business, uh, get the right talent on board and, and build the right strategy. And then we in-house uh, execute as, as an agency, basically. Thanks for the introduction, Stefan. Edwin, would you mind giving our viewers an introduction to yourself yep. and your role at Booktopia? Yeah, of course. Cool. So my name's Edwin. I'm the Serum Manager at Booktopia. Um, I've been at the company for just over two years. Um, so this involves, you know, managing the strategy across the email channel as well as the push notification channel. Um, yeah, so I manage a team of three. We recently doubled down at, towards the end of 2019, growing the, the team from two to four. Um, and yeah, we, over just, just a top line summary, over the two years, we've increased the email channel revenue um, from just over 40%, you know, which was definitely, you know, going to get the attention of our viewers, hopefully. That's some amazing results, Edwin. And Stefan, it's been a really big year for Booktopia. Not only did you list on the Australian Stock Exchange at the end of last year, but you also doubled your earnings, putting your total revenue at roughly 200 million a year. Can you tell us a little bit about your growth strategy for Booktopia and your unique approach to building a loyalty strategy to achieve that growth? Yeah, sure. Um I don't think it's that unique, to be honest. Um, I, I think like, like, like most retailers, we, uh, we, we, we think customer first and we try and really build an experience that goes across any kind of channel and any kind of experience with that mindset and focus on what, what's really best for the customer. And I think we've probably seen an environment where everybody kind of says that. And the question is, well, what's the difference between, between Booktopia and then really everybody else? Uh, and I think one of the big differences is that we're, we're willing to say goodbye to revenue for the sake of, of not uh, creating a bad experience to customers. Uh, we, we would rather lose out on an order and lose out on revenue than, than disappointing a customer. So one of the major differences between us and, and, and so many others out there is that we actually structure our acquisition program and retention program after, after that. So we will go out and look at, well, how many customers are we expecting to acquire? How many units are we expected to ship out during a day? Then we actually model out our entire marketing plan after that and actually make sure that we're not putting too many orders into the system on any, any given day. Uh, and that's again, to make sure that our warehouse have all the right people down in the distribution center to send out everything. So what's critically important for us is that we go out and always deliver on our promise to our customers. And that's always gonna be our focus. Uh, so what we saw here over the last few years, of course, was that when COVID hit here more than a year ago, and we were in the bittersweet situation of uh, working in online retail and all the offline bookstores had to close down and people had to buy online, we of course had a massive surge in people buying online for the first time. So it was critically important for us to really go out and change our entire marketing program to go out and accommodate all those new customers coming in while making sure that we send all the orders out at the right time. So I guess one of the biggest changes that we've been doing here over the last year that's really been part of our core growth strategy is to always ensure that every single customer had their expectations fulfilled and exceeded at any given moment. So that's been our core focus and that's been one of our most critical strategies that we've executed on. 
Stefan, thanks so much for giving us a little bit of light on uh, what your strategy has been for this year. And also later on, we'll talk about where you want to take that strategy going forward. But Edwin, coming back to you, based on Stefan's strategy and this, this approach to customers and loyalty, how has your CRM strategy mapped to Stefan's loyalty strategy and the vision? And can you talk us through a little yeah. bit about your CRM strategy and how you're actually creating that experience for the customer? Yeah, so um, for our strategy, you know, we developed it to be quite, quite simple. Um, so we just want to consider consistently ask ourselves, you know, how do I improve the customer experience? Um, so firstly, we focus firstly on the first two metrics, revenue and cost of sale. But then secondly, how do we achieve the revenue and cost of sale? So that's based on splitting up our database into five different customer groups, right? So that's leads, first time buyers, active customers, defecting customers and inactive customers. And it's pretty simple. So we want to get as many active customers as possible, right? So we want to convert these leads customers. So these are customers that have, or potential customers that haven't made a purchase before. How do we get them to make their first purchase into the active bucket? Secondly is first time buyers. How do we get these guys to make their second order? What can we do, right? So that's the next question. And what's really important for us, especially, and it's probably really, really important for a lot of other companies is how do you reactivate your, your customers, right? So, you know, there's a, there's a leaky bucket analogy, right? We have, our database is a bucket. We're pouring all of these first time or new customers into the bucket, right? But, you know, there's a hole at the bottom and we need to tape it up. And that hole is leaking out water or is leaking out defecting inactive customers. That's a no-no. So what we do for CRM is to really focus on the loyalty piece and for retention to really get that sticky tape and seal that up and get those customers back into the active pool. So in, in, in summary, try to get as many active customers as you can um, in, in your database. And when it comes to the type of programs that you have live to drive that engagement, it, you typically see different types of customers across various stages of their life cycle and across different channels. So they like to engage across different channels and timing here is extremely important to be able to target your customers. How, what kind of programs do you have in place today? And how do you manage these programs based on the purchase frequency of each of these customers, bearing in mind that each customer is different and what they're looking for is different? Yep, so yeah, so it's pretty, this is pretty easy. So I'm gonna summarize it down into free automations. I suggest, you know, viewers get a pen and paper or start writing some notes down. These are some really quick wins and really some, really like some low hanging fruit. So these free automations that worked really well for us is the winback automation, card abandonment, very important, and as well as our welcome onboarding automation. So I'll take you through everything uh, first. So I'll start with the winback automation. Um, so firstly, you know, we need, you need to really understand your database, right? Where is your, your potential revenue currently and in the future? Where are you going to make the most bang for your buck, right? So what we've seen is, you know, we, our, our biggest opportunity is really targeting these defecting and inactive customers. We have a lot of them, um, but the goal is, or my perfect world is to have zero defecting customers and zero inactive customers, and we have everyone in the active pool, right? Um, so yeah, so I'll walk you through the winback automation. Uh, we pretty much have set up uh, our winback automations across two years. Um, and we target customers based on what they want to receive, right? So the customer is always first. When we're sending out emails, it's not just the, hey, we miss you and come back and buy. We've done a lot of analysis, A-B testing on what does a customer really want to see, uh, see and, um, you know, redeem. So an example of what we've done for all of our win back emails is tested out every single offer that we, we, we can include or offer to our customers. So this is a, for example, free shipping um, offers, 5%, 10%, $10 off, $5 off. And we really look at what had the highest conversion rate. And by looking at conversion rate and transactions, transaction is amazing because every transaction you get from Winback Automation is an active customer now because they literally haven't made a purchase in six months. And if they've converted on your email, then they're an active customer, right? So it's really, really important to look at that as well as conversion rate. The higher the conversion rate, the more engaged, the customers love this, love this offer based on conversion rate. If it's a really low conversion rate, well, the customer didn't really like that email, right? So we really took all this into consideration and applied it into our winback automation and just very, very top line, really, really focus, or well, this is a tip for marketers, really, really focus on uh, targeting customers early in the customer lifecycle journey, right? Target target customers six in six months. If I made it, haven't made a purchase in six months, tar that's like your main, main priority, right? 
because data shows for us, um, I think it's like 60% is more likely to convert if they haven't made a purchase in six months versus two years. So it's gonna be very, very hard to win back those customers if they haven't made a purchase in two years. And um, what we've seen in data as well is we incre we've seen an increase in revenue by 4X by targeting the six month segment. So very, very important, it's a quick win. It doesn't take too long to set up and um, yeah, definitely take that, um, take that advice. Um, and also I can, yeah, I can also go through like a couple other automations as well. Um, another quick win is the card abandonment automation. Like, you know, a lot of, hopefully a lot of marketers know what a card abandonment automation is, but for those who don't, um, just, a, just a, some quick tips that this card abandonment automation for us is the highest revenue contributor automation at Booktopia. So this is a no brainer. If you guys haven't implemented this in your own companies, um, please do so. Um, so, you know, for me, this is a lot of op missed opportunity if you haven't been reminding customers what they have left in their cart, right? Um, and, you know, so life is full of distractions, right? You are, you know, shopping on, on the bus or the train or at home and, you know, your baby interrupts you or whatnot. You know, there's always distractions that prevent you from making a purchase, right? This is a really good opportunity to send them a card abandonment email. So, you, you know, it's based on intent. They're, they're, they've visited the website. They're warm. They're a warm audience. So it's a no-brainer. They will. They're happy to receive this. This email has you know the products that were in your cart. So it's definitely a no-brainer. It's very very super personalized. It's not like a bland broad email. So that's what's really really working for us. And um, the third one is a welcome onboarding automation. So three very very key automations that doesn't take too long to set up. So the welcome onboarding automation. I'll walk you guys through that. Um, so pretty much a lot of companies have just one welcome email. I, I know a lot of companies that do. They just go, you create an account and you just get a, hey, welcome to X company, right? Um, there is a lot of lot, lot more you can do with the welcome onboarding automation. Um, so firstly, we do have a welcome um, to Booktopia email on account creation. But as, as a good marketer, you want to really craft out that 14-day customer experience across two weeks, right? What emails do you want your first time customers to receive in these two weeks? A lot of companies just go, hey, welcome to this company and then just send you an, a, a random email, right? You need to craft these emails very, very specific to these customers, um, you know, because they're a first time customer. You wanna build that brand relationship, build that relationship from company to customer, which is very, very important. And it's gonna not pay off short term, but in the long term, it's 100%. And um, how I've set this up is, you know, these customers that have placed an order, we have the welcome to Booktopia. The second email, don't like make them, don't, you don't want to sell them anything. A lot, of, a lot of marketers make this mistake where they just want to go sell, 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 buy, buy, buy from us, right? Um, for me, um, I've structured this where I want to drive them to the blog. We have, we have a, a great team of, you know, uh, content creators, social media teams that, you know, really spend a lot of time crafting up podcasts, uh, articles um, that really, really can build brand and trust um, as from, from a company's point of view and to the customer's point of view as well. Um, the third email that I, I send out is driving to a bargains page. So, you know, promoting an upsell that's triggered, I think four days after that first email. The other, the other three emails is gift ideas. So giving customers an excuse to make another purchase based on, you know, if they wanna buy a gift or um, to a family member. Um, we have a pre-order campaign and, um, pre-order campaign and then our campaigns competitions email. So these, the reasons why I picked these particular uh, emails is I've looked through the data and it, it's, it's shown that customers enjoy and have visited these pages. These pages have high conversions. So really, really think about the customer and what they really want to um, see in terms of um, your welcome onboarding automation. So I hope that helped. That was, uh, uh, that's a lot that you do with between yes. yourself and, and your team. And um, Stefan, just coming back to you, uh, Edward mentioned, Edwin mentioned a, a really specific point about how do you drive that first time to repeat buyer? Uh, in the last year, the spike in online sales and customer acquisition is a, is a trend that many retail brands have experienced. Uh, in terms of your strategy, is your strategy going to be different to retaining these uh, new customers who've bought from your brand? And would you look to, to change up or accelerate that first time to repeat process? 
A great question. So again, COVID has actually had quite a big, big, uh, big accelerant on uh, on what kind of customers it is that we're getting into the to, to the to the funnel of of interesting um, buyers, uh, particularly the uh, the cohorts of Generation Boomers and and that generation just south of that, where we see north of forty percent increase in uh, in. Um, in traffic and interest from those particular cohorts coming in year over year. So obviously this comes pretty logically from uh, physical stores being closing down and the boomer generation that, uh, you know, the 60 or even 50, 50 plus is probably always have a little bit of a distrust uh, to, to buying online, a bit more familiarity and wanting to buy down in physical stores and, and as such the online penetration from those particular cohorts and demographics have always been looking a little bit unfavorable compared to, to other courts. So what, what we've seen here, particularly during COVID was that that particular uh, segment would be significantly more interesting for us to really speak to and be able to go out and market to with the with a humble hat on we of course uh, tried to make sure that we took the responsibility of building our brand uh, towards those particular cohorts as they as they came in um, and what i mean with that was that when when the stores closed and all these people for the first time ever tried to buy something online um, you need to take a really uh, a really humble approach to that and really remind yourself that 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 moment is actually profoundly important not just for you as a company but also for for the for the customer that's buying something online for the first time there's a responsibility around that and you need to have a you need to have respect for that so so what we really try to do is really consider well, what could we do in that particular environment what would that actually look like how can we how can we target that and, and i think edwin shared a lot of gold here before in terms of really having a focus on how do you drive that second order how do you drive the third order and the fourth order and the fifth order and really have that focus around well what do you do? What do you say the first time around? And how do you keep communicating? What kind of values do you need to showcase? And as Edwin uh, beautifully articulated here before, it's really about figuring out what matters for the different cohorts and then speaking to the individual person or you know cohort. We all want to do one-on-one -on -one personalization, but uh, we also have finite resources for, for executing comps and, and creatives. So obviously we often bucket things together and speak to them in buckets and in groups. But that those are some of the, the, the primary things that we've, that we've been working on. Stefan, thanks for thanks for that uh, point of view. And just another question back at you. There's a, there's often a, an understanding where you need a customer loyalty program to drive customer loyalty, but actually uh, a loyalty program is just a tactic within an over, overall loyalty strategy. And based off what you and Edwin have shared so far, and your approach to driving customer loyalty. How, how have you seen this impact your business? I mean, both from a from a dry, your vision perspective and also if you even plan on launching a customer loyalty program among your uh, or so many things that you already have going on to be able to drive customer loyalty. Hmm. Uh, was that one for me or was that one for Evan? That one was for you. All right. Uh, look, um, we, we've actually rolled out quite a few things. I'd like to think that we're in the baby stages of having a proper uh, lo loyalty program here. And, and we, we use it quite often, the terminology lo loyalty program. Um, and at its core, it's probably more about customer relevance th th than anything else and finding a way to keep being relevant for customers. And, and we try and jump through all these hoops of trying to satisfy customers with what we think matters for them. And I think one of the biggest journeys that we need to undertake as a company, and we've done a few things, and I'll, I'll touch on that one. But one of the journeys that we do need to take uh, even further for us uh, is that we need to interrogate our customers even more and really figure out what it is that they want and really figure out what, what they need. Uh, and as the business has grown, you mentioned it before, and we, we've grown quite a lot over the last few years and, and we, are, we are the largest online bookstore. And, and, and with that probably also comes a, an unfortunate little bit of a, of a case of perhaps resting on our laws a little bit. And we need to challenge ourselves and really keep talking to the customers and keep understanding what is it they need, need and want uh, to make sure that we can keep being relevant for them. And that becomes even more prevalent when you're acquiring other companies, you're acquiring new customer cohorts, you're starting up new business units, uh, in particular for Booktopia, that's, uh, that's acquired a lot of new business units and a lot of new business areas and business to business. We also started a publishing unit. Uh, we're more relevant for a lot more cohorts than we've been before. So what loyalty means changes. Uh, and it's different for all these different types of customers that we're now having in, in, in our business. And as such, our journey needs to evolve even, even more. Some of the things that we've been doing so far in the old school standard uh, loyalty programs have been everything from points we're using here in Australia. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a travel or rather a, a flight company called uh, Qantas here in Australia, where we're working with them. They have something called points and uh, they work with a lot of different businesses 
where uh, it's basically a rewards program where you can uh, let your customers earn points and they can then use that to travel or other things that's part of these programs. So good old fashioned uh, points-based loyalty program. We have then integrated that into our e-commerce experience. So when you're buying uh, books on our website, whether or not you might be a business or a private individual, you will be earning points that you can then use to, to, to fly with or check into hotels or redeem on whatever else is part of this, this larger program. So that's one of the things that we have in a good old fashioned loyalty program. But we also like to kind of spice that up a little bit with more integrated programs. And that's where, where Edwin and, and his team here are running some of the largest programs that we have around. You could debate, re reward them through proper RFM scoring and looking at what kind of deals and offers should be rewarding different kind of customers with based on yeah proper good old, old fashioned RFM scoring. Um, and Edwin will touch on that a little bit later as well on, on what that is and how he works with it. But, but outside of that, we also have a lot of other programs where we're looking at, well, how can we get loyal customers access to, to deals before anybody else like VIP access, access? Uh, and, and those are some of the those are some of the critical aspects that we're doing. But but I really do consider us to be more more or less on the infancy stage, and we we have a lot more to learn there. Thanks, Stefan. Edwin, just coming back to you here. Stefan mentioned uh, a lot of great programs that you guys already have in place. And what we find is often brands find it difficult on where to prioritize their budgets and their resource. There's so many things that you can do. How do you understand what to do first based on the budget that you have? And how do you ensure you're making the right decision and investing your budget in the right way that's really going to drive that return on investment? Yeah, so for, for us, you know, budget prioritization is, you know, quite easy. We focus on, you know, what do customers want to receive, right? If they are enjoying this and converting a lot for this particular offer or this messaging, you know, you can sell for, from an email. If there's high open rates, high click-through rates, high, high revenue, customers are loving this, this, this email. If, um, you know, we have a particular offer, if it's a free shipping message and it has like, you know, 20% conversion rate, that's quite good. A lot of customers are enjoying that. So we really focus on that and really prioritize what a customer wants to wants to receive. So, for example, customers really love uh, receiving Solus email. So Solus email is pretty much promoting one particular title. And you know what we do with you know all our data is we target customers based on if we want to promote this book from X author, we're going to target customers who have previously purchased from that author and create a really good personalized message and experience for those customers. So for example. You know, you, you, you like Jamie Oliver and you love his cookbooks and, you, you know, you cook at home and you cook for the kids and the family, right? Um, he has a new book coming up, um, you know, and you have, you have a good track record of you purchased four of his other cookbooks. So what we do on a, on a scale is we target this segment of customers who have purchased Jamie Oliver cookbooks to his new upcoming email. And this has seen, we've seen really high conversion rates and across all performance metrics. And, you know, you can, we can really see like a really good, healthy revenue per delivered. Um, this is a key metric that I use for, for forecasting as well. Um, and it's all about the customer, right? Sending, sending the right message to the right person at the right time. That's what you know, we're, we're all about. So, yeah. And Edwin, how do you know which is the right type of customer to invest in? Yep. So, you know, we, for, for us, it's really important that, you know, we have, we have a variety of different customers, right? And we, we really are focusing right now on collecting first party data to really know what type of customers are they, right? So, We've, we've recently implemented where customers are able to tell us, are they a student? Are they a teacher? You know, are they a government agency? Um, you know, are they just a personal? So there's all these different types of customers we want to um, you know, target. And once you have that data, you can really create a really good experience based on, you know, if you're a teacher, we're going to be tailoring teach, like, uh, books or content related to teachers. Another one is students. Students can really tell us what course are they studying so we can really tailor the textbooks we want to serve them in, in emails and through our marketing communication as well. Um, there's so much data points that you know, I can list out, purchase behavior, how frequently have they bought from a particular category? Um, and the list goes on, you know, categories as particular ISBNs or particular books that they, they like to, um, to read. Um, so yeah, that, that's how we can really, really prioritize the particular customers we want to, to go for. But in, in summary, students are very important to us. Um, there's all these teachers, governments, businesses as well is a really, really key driver for us as well and very, very important. And, you know, if, you're, if your company is just based on just sending to personal accounts or just regular customers, you're, not, you're missing out on a lot of opportunity because you really need to tailor your marketing to a law firm or, you know, um, different types of businesses or real estate agents or, you know, so there's a, 
there's a whole variety of different industries, you know, veterinarians or doctors. And so that's very, 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 very important to really tailor that messaging to, you know, the customer, who is, who is your customer and what is the message you want to convey? And Edwin, just stay with you just for one second. It's what you've achieved with yourself and your team in such a short space of time is really amazing. Would you be able to give some insights and guidelines as to the choice in technology partners and technology that you have to help you achieve uh, your loyalty strategy? And also, how do you match that to what Stefan's vision yeah. is? So like, so MarTech or the marketing technology, you know, it's quite important on, you know, how, you, how you're planning and executing your CRM strategy. The platform you're using or the technology you're using is very, very important. Um, and with that, with that platform, how you collect customer data is also very important. So, you know, for me to avoid like analysis paralysis, you know, too much data and you don't have, you can't make any decisions is there's two things. So how are we collecting the customer's data and how we, how we are using it to build um, relationships with our customers as well. So, you know, with, with this customer data, we can be quite granular and super personalized to really create a really good experience based on, you know, what I've just kind of covered recently is if a customer has purchased from an author or from a particular category or enjoy, you know, this content or these books or the, this ebook or um, audiobook, let's serve them that. We have the data. We need to, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity where marketers really need to make use of analyzing the data seeing what customers want to be to enjoy or like and serve them that content, you know, you, and you will see that you, you will see once you um, are able to achieve super personalization or being very granular in your segments and your content, it's going to pay off over, you will see that in your performance metrics and in, also in the long term as well, you will see unsubscribe rates decrease. You know, if you're sending something that's irrelevant or it's not related to a customer, they get unsubscribed from your email, right? And you will never be able to contact them again by the email channel, right? So it's very, very, very important to ensure that you're sending the right message to, to the right customer. Thanks, Edwin. And Stefan, just coming back to you with the same question is how important is choosing the right technology partner to help you achieve what you want to achieve from a strategic perspective? Yeah, Edwin sums it up well. Um, look, I, I, I think the key thing here for everybody really is to to always focus on strategy first. You know, strategy and people first. Figure out where it is that the company is going and and align with all the different departments and all the different divisions on where it is that we're heading. How do we get there? Uh, ultimately, how is this what we need to do to to deliver the results that we want to deliver on a certain horizon? And you know, sometimes you need to sprint and sometimes you need to crawl, depending on the business and what journey the business is on. So I think everybody needs to find a way to right size their technology to the journey that needs to go on as, as, as an individual company. Uh, and, and taking that journey is, of course, about talking about, well, what is it that becomes imperative to execute, to execute on the strategy? Uh, and Edwin has been talking about a few of the, those tactics before and some of the core strategies around you know, what do you actually need to drive some revenue? What do you need to do to drive repeat purchase? How are you going to be doing that? And, uh, and, and from there... You should really be working on what is it that you're going to be doing to drive the revenue and drive the outcomes and then answer the question on what tools do I need to be able to do that. It shouldn't be the other way around. And I guess we see that quite often where people being either sold a tool and then try to figure out well, how do we even swing this hammer? And then comes the final question, do we even have the people who can even lift that hammer? Uh, so, and, and that's that's often what I see. So, so, so one of the critical aspects of choosing technology and choosing what vendors to go for is first and foremost, figuring out well, what is it that the business need? Figure out what, what is it that facilitates the strategy? What kind of tactics do we need to roll out to facilitate that tactic? What people do we have in place to be able to execute on that those tactics and that strategy? And do we have what we need to be able to do then? And uh, when all things align and all, all, all docs are quacking, then uh, then you got, you got the right tool. And the right approach is, of course, to go out to tender, go, go out and talk to vendors and figure out uh, how are we actually going to be operationalizing this? How are we actually going to be executing this in the normal environment? Do we have the right people? What do we need? Do we need to have a, a joint solution with uh, uh, with ha half, um, half vendor uh, client facing solution where the vendor is part of the actual solution and they have client facing experts that's part of your team or works in, in conjunction or in, in lockstep with your own team or do you want to do everything yourself uh, do you want to be able to execute everything yourself without any expertise from, from the vendor so I think th those are some of the critical aspects uh, in, in of course selecting the right uh, technology to to execute on the strategy 
Thank you both for your insights there. And Steph, I'm just staying with you one second here. Black Friday or any seasonal event is a very big deal for most retail brands, whether you're online or even multi-channel. And most of the time, uh, aggressive discounts and who can shout the loudest when it comes to sales is typically the, the strategy that, that most brands tend to follow. But we're seeing a little bit of a shift now where brands are becoming more personalized in their approach to Black Friday or their approach to any seasonal sale. How important it is to how important is it for Booktopia when it comes to managing your customers during Black Friday or any season event? Well, immediately, I'm, I'm knee-jerking knee the answer of it's not, um, <laughs> but, but the answer is a little bit more nuanced than that. Look, um, uh, we, we, we make money. Uh, we're here to make money, not give away products. Um, I, I don't believe in it. Uh, I don't subscribe to it. Um, that's so easy when you're working in a category where, where you might not have to. There's so many other categories and the people who are listening and watching to this will go, that doesn't apply to me and my business. For me and my business, it's super relevant to be, be out there on that particular period where everybody's buying those products. So, so I guess I need to be a little bit more nuanced and not uh, to be relevant. Uh, look, the customer wallet is out in that particular period. Customers and people have kind of collectively decided, yeah, I'm okay with spending money in this particular period. On that particular date during the year, I'm gonna go bananas with my credit card. It's out, I'm just gonna be chucking it around everywhere. Uh, you would be almost silly if you're not taking advantage of the fact that people are thinking like that, because they are, you know, why wouldn't they? They're trying to chase those, those, uh, those discounts. But let's be real, I've been following this for, for years as well. I've been looking at every single deal that's, that's out there. <laughs> it's, it's not like it's the best products people are flocking on those particular dates it's frankly a bit bit of the crap that you have in the corner somewhere that you couldn't get rid of and oh look at that big discount um so look let's not kid ourselves here there, there's a bit of a cat and mouse between us and the, and the customers you know a lot of retailers join the join the party join the frenzy and find whatever they have in the coffers that they couldn't get rid of that's a excess inventory and, and look at us great deal <laughs> But how important was that for the actual customer? And how many customers then had an experience with you and your brand where you're just saying, look at the great deal that we have. From look, I, th I think there could be a case of brand erosion here and trust erosion if you're playing this incorrectly. So I, I think it's, it's a fine dance. But like I said, there can also be great value in going out on that particular period with some great products that you have great margins on. Uh, and bring that in front of an audience who's already purchase willing. Uh, conversion rates are going to be high on those, those, those dates. Um, Obviously, your cost to acquire a customer and get traffic is probably going to be a bit impacted too. So that's again that fine fine balance, right? So um, so I guess the answer here is that we don't subscribe to discounting. We don't subscribe to that that kind of discounting anyway. We don't really believe in that. We believe in providing value, and when we provide value to customers, they're willing to pay for it. Um, that's what we focus on and make a profit. So yeah, good business. I really love your point of view there, Stefan. Uh, Edwin, coming back to you with the same question. From a CRM perspective, how are you going to uh, manage Black Friday coming up or any seasonal sale? And CRM plays a really big function because you guys really know who the customer is during this time. So how would you and your team really plan for Black Friday or any seasonal sale going forward? Yeah, so, so for us, you know, we have a, a variety of seasonal campaigns. You know, it could be, you know, Boxing Day, it could be Christmas, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, and we have also booked Oberfest as, as well in October. So for us, it's in terms of um, seasonal campaigns, it's, it's all about loyalty and creating a good shopping experience for customers. This could be, you know, creating great offers for, for customers, getting competitions up for customers. Product curation is also a really good um, strategy as well, showing the right products to customers, as well as um, giving opportunity for, you know, customers to maybe purchase gifts as well. So for example, you know, we've seen that, you know, the customer's propensity to purchase has also um, increased which you know is is, is great for customers they they want to spend what is, as Stefan said their wallets are, are open but also we want to uh, ensure that we're, sh we're showing great products creating a great experience from cross channel from every single channel could be from push from email from the website from and we have to convey the same messaging across everything and it's all about continuity as well if a customer has clicked through from a CRM automation or a web push or from the site Everything needs to be aligned, has to have the same assets, same messaging to ensure that there is trust and continuity to the customer to ensure that they have a good experience across, across the, whole, the whole journey. From the minute they open up an email all the way through to when they've transacted and for getting their order delivered to them on, on time as well. Thanks, Edwin. Stefan, coming back to you, where do you see the next 12 to 18 months going, particularly in terms of taking your loyalty vision forward? 
good question too. Um, so shaking that crystal ball right now, which we all do here post COVID, <laughs> uh, if we can even call it post yet. <laughs> Look, I, I, I think we've, we, we've gone through a period right now of, I'm not gonna say it, <laughs> it's not unprecedented, uh, of, of a lot of growth. And the good thing right now is that this online penetration that we've been, uh, that we've been looking at uh, and the growth in online penetration, it, it's, it's of course exploded here over the last, uh, over the last year, year or so. So there's a, what is it now? I think it's around 13.8% online, on, online penetration right now versus last year, we were taking in around 8.7%, I think it was. So a significant lift in, in people being comfortable with buying products online. We kind of touched on it earlier, earlier on why that is. Uh, that's here to stay. That's going to stick. So we're just getting closer to UK and US, no, still a bit far from that, but we're getting closer right now to international levels of online comfort and online penetration. So there's, there's brand new people buying online right now, becoming more and more comfortable with that. So I, I think we need to really, really focus on, again, the people who had the least trust in it and, and make sure that we're creating the experiences for them. And because we have an understanding of what cohort it is, I think there's a different responsibility around it. It's so easy to just got, get sucked into building experiences for the people who we uh, connect with the most personally. Uh, and as such, it's easy to forget to build the, those great experiences and full life cycle journeys uh, for, for cohorts we might be a little bit less familiar with. But I think it's it's critically important right now to make sure that we're doing that and we're taking a responsibility for that. So from a loyalty perspective, I, th I, th I think it's really good for everybody to really figure out where was it that we got growth in our business if we got growth. Uh, some, of course, went the other direction, and that's, of course, horrible. But uh, for, for those who've changed their demographics and changed what customers matter to them, I think it's important to really spend the time getting to, be, to better understand them and then really ask all the questions you can to get to know them and then figure out how can we be relevant for you? And what do we need to do to make your life easier? What kind of products can we serve up for you? And, and you know, how do you like us to communicate with you? How do you prefer getting your strategy and journey served for you? And, uh, as, and then answer the question, both technology-wise and communication-wise to those answers. I think that's the key. Thanks, Stefan, for those insights. And Edward, coming back to you, where do you see the next 12 to 18 months going, particularly in terms of CRM and how you can deliver to the business and to the loyalty vision going forward? Yeah, so, you know, we, we've got a lot of growth from the last year. You know, where I see, you know, CRM and email marketing headed is, you know, with the post-pandemic and, you know, more customers shopping online, um, you know, I see that there is a lot more digital marketing in the market right now. There's so much messaging and so much noise in the market. So where I see the future is, is we need to cut through the clutter to get through because there's, the a customer's inbox is now flooded because everyone has realized that everyone's shopping and the demand has increased. So how I believe that we're, what we're going to be doing in, in the future is we're going to be, how, how can we be more relevant? How can we be more, create a better experience for customers? And the solution for that is you know big data or analytics looking through the data and really really analyzing what a customer likes to receive in in their emails or what books do they enjoy really really get to know your your customer um, an example like I can I can give you right is we 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 send out like many emails you know food cooking um, crime fiction right so for me I see that we need to be able to analyze the data on what email is most suited to this customer on a particular time or day? For example, like if you have purchased, um, you know, the same example, Jamie Oliver cookbook, right? But you also have bought a Bluey picture book for, for your kids on the same day. And we're triggering these two emails for, for today, this morning, right? Which email do we send you? Because we're not going to send you both emails. We want to send you only one. We don't want to be spammy, right? So I believe that in, in the future, marketers are going to be more smarter on analyzing using the RFM model, which, which is more suited by the content to this customer. So I believe there would be some permutation of like a, a hierarchy of the RFM model. So the RFM model is recency, frequency, and monetary. So, you know, how recent did, you know, pay or purchase the Jamie Oliver book? Was it last year? But then she bought, you know, three cookbooks, I mean, three picture books. So then that email might be relevant. But then what would trump that field is, you know, the amount spent. So she spent like $1,000 on, on picture books versus the cookbook. So then maybe that would be more relevant, right? So there's all these different variables that, you know, we need to take into consideration. Another one would be um, the amount of orders, you know. So she could have bought four books, spent $1,000, and it was recent in the last week. We're going to prioritize that email and you're going to receive that based on high engagement. So... I really believe that, you know, our marketing is going to be 
optimized, it's definitely going to show more results based on super personalization and being very, very granular rather than just sending a cooking email to someone who has just bought from cooking, right? There's more, there's more, more ways that marketers can be smart. And I see there's definitely potential if marketers can find a sweet spot on analyzing the data and how they can apply it to, you know, their BA, BAU campaigns, CRM automations and into any, any marketing um, campaigns that they're running as well. Um, and what else? Yeah. So pretty much, I also have some advice as well that I kind of wanted to, to share uh, if, if that's okay. Oh, please. Um, but yeah, so like, yeah, so like, you know, I want to try to, you know, give as much value as I can. Hopefully, you know, the win back automations, the shopping cart reminder and the welcome journey helps uh, a lot of the marketers. Um, but, you know, for me as well is, you know, how, how did I implement this strategy and execute it and, you know, come up with all these ideas. Um, you know, for me, there's two things that I really want to, to share with you know, other marketers is, um, you know, flow state and, and curiosity. So this is very like top level for me, like flow state is quite important. It's where I'm the most productive and, um, you know, com you're completely immersed in a task and there's, there's no distractions. And that's like, yeah, this is where you come up with the best ideas. So um, as, as, you know, a tip for other marketers, you know, really try to find out how you can get into that state of flow because, you know, CRM automations, can be you know, quite technical. You're thinking of the logic and thinking of all these different scenarios, right? When you're setting up an automation. So what, what I do as some tips is, you know, I take a day from home, you know, I set a clear goal, eliminate distractions, set a time and what, I'm, what a, a task that I'm going to achieve. So this could be, for example, I'm setting up a wish list price drop automation where we notify customers that a product in their wish list has dropped in price. You know, that's, it's, that's an amazing customer experience because some that a customer has put in a product in their wish list and now it's dropping price so it's like a win-win right um so things like that and then another one that i wanted to touch on is just you know being being curious right um you always want to open your mind up for you know new things new ideas and implement that but you need to back that up on you know on data right so i see that to be to become a good marketer you need some level of curiosity you know to try new things um, you know, Steph knows I'm all about testing, right? So um, I'm always very open, but it needs to be backed up by data. Like so the question I always ask myself is, you know, does, does variant A perform better to the customer than variant B, right? And if, if you don't know the answer, well, then you're in for a lot of testing because you need to test this multiple times to, you know, validate that, that answer. Like, okay, well, I know now that variant B is the way to go, that customers love this, we're going to move forward with that. And you do this several times, ensure, you know, markers document your, your learnings as well. So, um, you know, previously when I, when I started, um, there wasn't much um, documentation. Now there is, you know, pages and pages of all these tests, right? So when you hire a new person, they can literally just read all your tests and be up to scratch straight away in, in, in a matter of a day of what was tested and, you know, what are the opportunities that, you know, you, you, can, you can implement as well. So, yeah, those are my, those are my quick tips. Um, I know, Stefan, you have any quick tips to share as well to the audience? Just, just listen to that guy. Let, no, other way. Sorry. And anyway, um, look, um, uh, Ed, I think Edwin is downplaying it right now. To, to, to be frank, uh, what we haven't really touched on is, uh, I think it was here last year, Octopia sent out two hundred and sixty million emails. Uh, we have three million active subscribers that we are actively talking to. Uh, so, so it's a pretty big program, to be, to be quite frank. And, and while we're also very mindful that there's a there's things that we can do or, or will be doing that perhaps doesn't fit everybody and, and isn't for everybody. Uh, there, there's certainly a lot of learning. But, uh, and I think one of the most important takeaways here for anyone in managerial positions and managing CRM programs of, of any kind is make sure that your team has uh, what I like to think of as being licensed to play, uh, licensed to learn and permission to play. Uh, it needs to be possible to have these lab mentalities where you have a, a bunch of, like I said to Edwin here earlier today, it's a bunch. Of, it's like a bunch of scientists that's kind of mixing red and yellow together and blowing up there. Nope, that didn't work. Okay, uh, green and green and gold over there. Ah, oh, that worked. Okay, let's let's work a little bit more with that. So you do need to foster that playful, uh, that playful atmosphere and DNA in, in the business where people have that permission to play and feel like they can do that. And and there's. Uh, you know, there's possibility both technically and team-wise and, uh, you know, also in terms of, of being able to fail and just take those learnings. Uh, and what Edwin is, and his team is, is doing phenomenally well is, is to adapt all those learnings into a cookbook uh, and basically have an entire playbook that really talks about what did we learn. And that will go down into 
dare I say, generations where, <laughs> where, where future mortgages will be able to go back and, and look at all those learnings. It isn't a case of mortgages just going, oh, okay, learn, learn that. Now it sits in my brain and, and that's where it is. When I'm leaving, it's leaving with me. There's literally a playbook that people can go in and see what were the learnings and, and, and how, did we, how did we accomplish that and, and how did the customers react to that? So we have this long, long, long documentation around, around that. And there's a lot of learnings there. There's a lot of, a lot of things for, for Edwin and his team to, to both lean back into, to whip out again when, when, when a new campaign comes up and, uh, and adopt those learnings in the future. But most of all, most of all it's fun. It's got to be fun. You know? and, uh, and yeah, that's probably my biggest, biggest uh, thing to put to the table here is have goddamn fun. <laughs> Stefan and Edwin, thank you so much for joining us today. I certainly found your tips, advice, and your insights and the success extremely enjoyable to listen to. We're lucky to have a great partnership with a fast growing business such as Booktopia, and we very much look forward to helping you accelerate your loyalty vision even further. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Well, thanks, guys. Thanks for having us. Thank you. At Retail Revival this year, we have many other leading brands who are sharing their insights and best practice on their success. Please be sure to catch the other sessions, but they're also made available on demand to watch them at your convenience. On behalf of everyone at Imasis and SAP, thank you for your time and thank you for joining us today. Mm -hmm.